everybody and welcome to the Cybos Big Issue Debate. My name is Julia Streets and I'm delighted to be the moderator for this session. Just to explain very quickly, I have served on the Executive Committee of the Technology Business of the New York Stock Exchange. I'm a female founder and entrepreneur and I advise businesses from smaller startups to some of the world's largest organisations and the question of talent comes up a great deal. That actually brought me to start my own podcast called Diverse City Podcast, Diversity and Inclusion in Financial Services with listeners all over the world. So imagine my joy when Cybos asked me if I would host this discussion. Diversity in investment needs to move up a gear. There is so much data that supports the argument that diversity and inclusion drives better performance, and we're going to explore that today. I'm joined by four leading lights in the industry, well known for not only their business acumen and their abilities, but also as speakers, commentators and contributors. So allow me to introduce them to you. First of all, I'm delighted we're joined by Corentine Porve Cledier. Now she's the head of RepoClear and Collateral Liquidity Management at LCH. She leads the largest pool of Euro-denominated fixed income clearing with more than 80 member banks across the globe. She's been with the London Stock Exchange Group for some 10 years now, holding a variety of positions from the creation of credit default swaps clearing for LCH to global leadership of their regulatory strategy, where she led some critical Brexit related negotiations and supported strategic business development in the EU and also in Asia. Quarantine, wonderful to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, Julia. It's a pleasure to be here. Very excited about the conversation to come. Wonderful. Great, thank you. And joining our quarantine today is Iris Bonnet, who is the Albert Pratt Professor of Business and Government and the Academic Dean at Harvard Kennedy School. She's a behavioural economist combining insights from economics and psychology to improve decision making in organisations and in society, often with a gender or cross-cultural perspective. Her most recent research examines behavioural design to de-bias how we live, learn and work. And she is the uh, author of an award-winning book, What Works? Gender Equality by Design, and advises governments and companies around the world. So Iris, great to see you. Thanks for joining us today. Hello, Julia. Very happy to be here. Fabulous. Thank you. And uh, joining us is also Glenda So, who is the head of post-trade at the Hong Kong Exchange. Now, Glenda has more than 20 years of experience in managing sizable operations teams within international financial institutions in Hong Kong, Singapore and the US. Prior to the Hong Kong Exchange, Glenda worked for Allianz Global Investor, Sun Kang Kai and also Graticule Asset Management all in Asia. And prior to that, spent more than 20 years with Goldman Sachs heading up their operations team. Glenda, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Join us today. Hi, Julia. Nice to be here. And last but no means least, we're delighted to be joined by Peter Aquaboa, who's the global head of shared services operations at Morgan Stanley. Currently, he's managing the firm's settlement and payments infrastructure. And additionally, he is chair of the Morgan Stanley Payments Risk Steering Committee and member of the Federal Reserve Bank's Payments Risk Committee. He is also co-chair of the Morgan Stanley Black Employee Network Group, also known as BENG. Peter, wonderful to see you. Thank you, Julia. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Such a pleasure to be here today. Perfect. So I have so been looking forward to this discussion. There are so many conversations about diversity and inclusion. When we talk about inclusion, we mean, of course, the entire spectrum that is diversity and inclusion. So we think about gender, ethnic minority representation, LGBTQI plus issues, disability, visible and invisible, faith, cognitive diversity, social mobility, age, and so much more as well. Now, there is a lot of discussion about this. There are, on one hand, organisations very committed to diversity inclusion, who will tell you that DNI is in their DNA and publish a great deal of brochureware, suggesting that they are truly diverse, when actually the lived experience of employees can feel very, very different. There are also amazing initiatives and networks and uh, pioneers who are trying to drive change. And so what today, what we really want to focus on is exploring where we have made positive progress. We also want to explore the areas and highlight the areas where we must focus and then inspire all of you, all of you enlightened leaders who have tuned in today, how you can take advantage of the commercial 
uh, benefits that diversity and inclusion will bring you and your organisations and your teams. So let's get started straight away. And Quarantine, I'm coming to you first of all. Now, I, uh, I wonder, you know, why, why are we still having this discussion? I mean, what concerns you most? Hmm. Thank you, Julia, for coming to me first. Not an easy shot. So, yeah. Um, if you allow me, I'll, I'll, I'll pivot just a, a tiny bit that question and, and ask the one behind your question, which is, you know, why do we still care? Why should we care? Why are we having that discussion, as you were saying? And um, there, I think it's quite important we spend a minute on this. Otherwise, we'll just be sort of bouncing back between people more or compass when we, what we want to do is really make collective concrete progress for our industry and broader. So three considerations about your, your question I would like to offer. One, to reject, and two, to perhaps acknowledge as being more interesting. The first one to reject is an idea that um, I'm afraid we still see floating around quite a lot that individuals uh, being identified as belonging to some of the groups you've mentioned as we are covering diversity as a whole, because they belong to those groups, people expect that they will think, act, or react a certain way, positive or negative, and these would be the reasons why they should be included or not. I think these ideas we have to reject straight away, right, because one of the goals of diversity and inclusion work is to recognize the individuals in their own diversity within those groups. So that being said, once we all are so diverse, there's one thing we have in common, which I think is at the heart of your question of why should we continue to actively care? That thing we have in common, and I'm sure Iris wouldn't deny that, is that experience of getting into a room on a stage or around a negotiation table and getting a very clear sense that maybe you're not quite um, the person that was expected to be here. And once you get that sense, effectively, you have a couple of seconds to um, get into people's heads, understand what their expectation, or expectation was, how you differ from that, where is the gap, how do you bridge it to be heard, and eventually to convince. And that forces you to develop some skills that um, are very critical in a leadership position for any business. And that's one of the many reasons why um, leaders from a diverse background always is understood as being a diverse background. Uh, it should be really, really strongly considered uh, every day. And the final point I would, I would mention there is um, we're, we're trying to look at this really wide issue from a business perspective. And as businesses, there's one thing we also have in common is that we constantly face a semi-invisible audience, you know, your market, you know, some of your clients, but there are so many more that you don't really know the future clients, the prospects, the talents you want to attract. And somehow all of those people, you're trying to convince them. How are you going to do that, right? And my take here, and if you allow me, I'll, I'll borrow some, some words that are not mine, and the quote is not going to be perfect. I haven't checked it. It's just coming up to my, my mind. But there was this British philosopher, Jeremy Bentham. He said something like, the best way to convince people is to love them as in understand them. And the best way to appear that you love them is to love them indeed. And where I'm going with that is we all have to be very humble about the piece of a problem that we can grasp as an individual when we are on our own, and all of the rest of that situation or problem we can't quite see. So I'll, I'll wrap up my point here. Mm -hmm. But to make it very clear, I'm seeing a cup here. Let's imagine this is a problem I'm trying to solve as a business. This is me. I'm going to look at it from this angle for potentially 10 years, and I might never see that tag right here. When somebody else is going to come right there, and this is the first thing they're going to see. So if I want to decide about the cup, I need that somebody else with me. I think that's why we should care more than ever. Well, well, let me bring in Iris there. It's a great, it's a great opening, opening comments there, and it's it's very interesting uh, to to unpick the whole point about how you feel as an individual, and then also how as you look at other perspectives as well. And and Iris, you know, organisational structures. When we think about driving change, particularly, uh, and obviously a lot of the work you've done around debiasing as well. Um, what, what do you look at that you think uh, has uh, had a really positive impact to shift some of those perceptions as well? Love your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you, Julia. Um, I think most importantly, we have to move beyond trying to fix minds or fixing people to fixing systems. So we really have to unpack our systems, our practices, procedures, how we hire, how we promote, how we do performance appraisals and de-bias them. 
the kinds of um, stereotypes or biases that a quarantine uh, reminded us of are not just in our minds. They're also, of course, in our systems because the systems were designed by people. And the good news in many ways is that systems are more easily changeable than people. So that's kind of my um, kind of my big message. And then working with organizations, we uh, go uh, quite deep into analyzing how they hire, how they recruit. You know, for example, do they use de-biased language in their job advertisements, more inclusive language that attracts 100% of the talent pool when they uh, evaluate job candidates? How do they do that? Do they do unstructured interviews, which we know are kind of the worst predictor of future performance? Or do they use something like work sample tests where we actually test what we look for in a candidate? When they do performance appraisals, what kinds of systems do they use? For example, many organizations ask their employees to self-evaluate first and then share those self-evaluations with their managers. So working with a financial services company, what we found, this is not really not rocket science, of course, is that people differ in their self-confidence when they self-evaluate. Uh, that's both cross-cultural, but also by gender um, in particular. So women give themselves lower self-evaluations than their male counterparts, holding everything else constant. And so when I now share my self-evaluations with you, Julia, of course, you're impacted by the rating that I give myself. And so that can lead to a vicious circle. Uh, so we found both gender effects and self-evaluations, but we also found racial effects for the U.S. This is a financial services company headquartered in the U.S. Um, on race. So that managers, in addition to what people do themselves, they also add, um, so to speak, a racial penalty, penalty and decrease uh, people of color's ratings even more. So looking at those data is really important. And that's kind of, I think, the takeaway here. In, the, in my book that you mentioned, there's, there's this part design, which is also memnonic. D stands for data. We need to understand, we need to measure what's happening before we do anything, not just throw money at the problem, but diagnose the problem. E stands for experimentation. We have to try out different things, really measure what works, what doesn't work. And then sign is kind of the idea of the signpost that it's not going to be enough to raise awareness. But in fact, we do have to start fixing systems to make it easier for all of us to get this right. Wonderful. That, that, that's that's a great way, actually, just to bring in Glenda here, because Glenda, I know you've been thinking a lot about the importance of measurement, and particularly when you've been thinking about sort of organisational structures as well. And, and I wonder what, um, you know, when you look at benchmarking and you look at uh, measurement, uh, what, what sort of progress you've experienced and, and your thoughts on measurement and benchmarking? benchmarking. Yeah. I mean, first of all, um, I think in finance, we all like data, right? So I think we are all uh, uh, encouraged or we, are all, we all love to see data and we all like to see progressions, right? So I think that the good things about data is um, it is a good way to demonstrate whether we put things into um, actions. So, so personally, I actually support what um, Iris mentioned about um, the, the data is, uh, is a very powerful ways to identify the problem. So um, the reason why I love data is, um, first of all, before you fix any problem, you have to identify the problem first. And, um, and then you can year to year measure your progress against uh, those uh, data from the previous year. There is no perfect answer to diversity, right? Whether 51%, 52%, there's no perfect, perfect numbers. And obviously, um, diversity is not something that you expect to see overnight. Um, it will be completely different, right? So I guess uh, diversity is a, is a journey. So that's why I think we need to develop uh, some sort of measurement so that to help people to identify problems and to demonstrate and to let people be encouraged or motivated by the progress that we made. I'll give you some example, right? I think in, um, in HKEX, we actually measure um, percentage of women um, in managers' positions um, because I think we, we want to aspire to not only have women, um, be, be just an employee, right? We want to measure uh, women's in managerial positions. And also we talk about also, uh, we also measure, or we also have some statistic about uh, women's in executive uh, positions. I think that's important, right? Because we want uh, more women to be in executive positions in the management committee, um, be able to have direct influence to the board, be able to have direct influence to the people in the organization. So that's why I think it is um, very important to have measurement as such so that we can make our progress um, against it. Um, like honestly, um, I think number is important, but um, sometimes 
um, I think making one or two meaningful um, big step will be a good way to demonstrate um, progress as well um, and to encourage people to do that further. Um, example, um, in, 19, in 2018, um, H.A. Yeeks appointed the first uh, uh, female uh, chairman in the organization it is an important role, and um, I guess uh, statistics important. But I think some key roles like this to able to demonstrate to the entire organizations about the progress that we made is actually very significant um, as well. Absolutely, and we're going to come onto the subject of role models uh, later on in the discussion as well, and that's uh, that, that's enormously helpful. And, and so then we've talked about it from a, an individual sort of lens, looking at the um, perceptions and 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 assumptions that we make. Also thinking about biases and then putting the systems around it. Thinking about the systems, how to address those, and also the measurements and the benchmarking and why that's important and and role models. But I think we have to return to a sort of big question about, you know, why all this matters as well, which is about, as I mentioned in my opening comments, about the commercial opportunity that is out there as well. And Peter, I would love to bring you in here as well to think about, um, you know, what's your been experience of the commercial opportunities that have presented themselves and you've taken advantage of, and, and of course, not just you, but, but many in the industry that might not have been there had there not been a commitment to diversity and inclusion? Thank you so much. Um, I think it's good to, uh, to hear from Corinthian and Iris just to go through at least why should we care and then also thinking about the data part. But I think um, to, to your point, Julia, the one thing that um, we have to complement or run above that is how do you actually make sure that this is also active within the organization? Um, most organizations will have um, a diverse team. We, we can do more, but they still have a good diverse team. And the question is really how do you ensure that you can take advantage of that? I'm assuming and I'm given that everybody understands that the commercial benefits. There's many, many um, research around the commercial benefits of that. But I think when I bring it back to myself, I can give some real life experiences about some of the things that I have actually experienced, why this thing is actually, from a commercial point of view, is important. And um, the power of networks is actually quite key, because I remember um, last year, um, we hosted a, a network event, which was very, very diverse. Um, and through that conversation, I got to meet um, one of the, the vice chair of our investment banking division, um, and someone who's been trying to um, penetrate the African market and in particular in Ghana. Um, and we got talking and the first question was, um, I've been trying to get into um, penetrating the Ghana market, can you help me? And knowing the background and having a conversation, not just about work, but having conversations about individuals and who you are and your background, he actually got to find out that I actually spent a lot of time in Ghana. And, and through that connection, we decided that we would team up. Now, you can think about someone being in operations, thinking actually, what has someone in operations got to do with commercial benefits of, um, of Morgan Stanley and, and so forth. But this individual actually felt that we can team up together and actually um, go to Ghana and have a conversation. And that's what we did. Within kind of three, four weeks, we teamed up. We put a proposal together. We actually flew to Ghana. We had a conversation with um, a number of um, a senior, um, senior guys there, which led to one of the, one of the biggest um, bond issuance in, in Africa, the three billion bond issuance that um, we, we managed to be one of the co-leaders on that. Um, and since then, we've actually done a second one and, and the rest is history. So mm -hmm. to answer your um, question, you know, this is not just about um, diversity for the sake of diversity. Um, the power of what you have internally and leveraging on that networks actually provides a, a real commercial benefit in that, in that place as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. And because I, I think it's important to, to frame it around the commercial imperative. And uh, it's been a wonderful way to kind of set the discussion. Uh, so thank you all for your kind of opening comments. But, you know, as I said, you know, organisations are complex places. You know, uh, and Iris, you, I mean, you spend all, a lot of your time advising, I mentioned in the opening, about governments and organisations as well. And in this next kind of section of time, I'd really like to begin to explore about where are the barriers? You know, what is hard to tackle? Because, um, you know, what hampers organisational progress? Yes, so uh, to promote change, we really need to think about uh, two variables, and that is the will to change and the way to change. And uh, both, I think, uh, need some work. Uh, so I'm actually very encouraged by the 
you know, the, the huge number of coalitions that now have started to emerge, including the financial services industry. So there's women in banking and finance in the UK. There is um, Paradigm for Parity working in the US. And by the way, I'm focusing on gender right now because that's my particular expertise. I'm not suggesting that's, of course, the only story about diversity, but that's um, my expertise. So anyway, so there are these coalitions now of CEOs, organizations, which commit uh, to certain actions. And I think that's actually quite important. So that's very helpful. And we do have some good evidence, again, from the UK on how to increase gender diversity in corporate boards, which really was a coalition of government, private sector, senior executive search firms, the media, academics, kind of coming together and make it happen. So it can work. Um, so I think that's the good news. But, you know, why haven't we made more pro progress? So I think the first one really is the will. So I think organizations have to think hard about, do we want this? Do we really care? Or are, is this just an add-on that we have another diversity training program? We have a leadership development program for the traditionally underrepresented groups, but we're not really actually doing something for real. I think that's the first one. And then the way to change, um, I also fear we might have focused a bit on the wrong interventions. And when I say actually wrong, um, I'm saying this in quotation marks, but I, I mean it quite literally in the sense that uh, what, what, we've, what we have been doing is just collect all the evidence out there on what works, what actually has, have, ha has had an impact. And I have to tell you, diversity training um, just can't be shown to have an impact. It can raise awareness, but then we have to build that bridge between these virtuous intentions and people's actions. And that's when we have to get into the systems and change the way we work. Um, and I think that's where, where the next chapter is going to have to be. Now that we have the will, we really have to focus on the way. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting because there there are, uh, and it has a comment that Quarantine made at the very beginning about, um, you know, making assumptions about people who happen to fall into networks or, or behave in a certain way. And, and I would say, and Glenda, I'm really, really keen for your thoughts on this about, you know, the arguably assumption uh, and homogeneity is the enemy of inclusion in so so many different ways. So early assumptions, whilst you might have the best intention about starting diversity programs, as Iris was just saying, um, actually is, is is a very risky way to go. And and from a Southeast Asian perspective, if I may, I'm really keen to hear because I, I hear people make make sweeping statements about Southeast Asia, and of course, you know, it's a very very uh, complex. Uh, region, if you like, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, what leaders must think about and take into account, particularly from your point of view. Yeah, um, thanks, Julia, for the questions. Um, I, I think what you said is actually completely right. We tend to gravitate towards the people that look alike uh, to us. Um, I quote sometimes is um, uh, in 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 the in in diversity terms. I actually feel that sometimes this is called you don't know what you don't know. Um, and in Asia, the added complexity is, I guess, um, in addition to uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, the added complexity will be uh, language and also uh, culture. And if you're not familiar with the culture, if you're not familiar with the language, you tend to be uh, very careful uh, or you tend to completely ignore that there is uh, some difference in there. So um, I'll give you some um, example. Um, I guess in uh, Southeast uh, Asia, especially I worked in Singapore before, uh, there are like numerous, numerous culture in uh, Singapore. They speak uh, all speak different uh, languages and they celebrate different holiday. Um, and they have different kind of uh, like New Year, right? So there's just a lot and a lot of uh, these kind of uh, situations. And to those people, right, all those holiday are actually important to them in their own uh, culture. So I guess... Um, um, my my trick is uh, you just need to um, be very humble to learn about uh, all these culture and develop a curiosity and be sensitive to the things that you don't know. And maybe on the things that you don't know, uh, try to find out, right? Or try to find out in your in your different trips to those countries, trying to trying to find those um, out. I have another um, example that um, because in I am from Hong Kong, so I speak uh, Cantonese. I work for Americans from before. Um, I went to uh, Taiwan um, for my uh, business trip. So in Taiwan, everyone speaks uh, Mandarin. To some extent, I am the one that is the exception. Right? I don't speak the same language. I don't. I don't born and uh, grow up in the same exact culture. Although we're still both Chinese, but it's slightly different. Right? The language is uh, slightly different. So um, when I went there, uh, the team start talking to me in um, English because um, they are not um, native Mandarin speaker. They, they native English speaker. They feel more comfortable. 
uh, speaking to me in uh, in 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 Mandarin than in English. And of course, they're very consciously aware that I'm not a native uh, Mandarin speaker as well. My Mandarin is actually all right, right? But in their mind, I am I'm their boss, right? I should speak. Uh, they should they should speak English with me. Um, so if I think about uh, 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 them, right? In American firm, they are like the minority, right? They're from a different culture. They're trying to adapt to the American culture by speaking um, English and trying to express themselves the best that they can. But um, but what I found is um, I think of them as a minority because they are um, working in an American firm, but from a whole firm standpoint, they are like the smaller group. Um, and I tried to speak to them in Mandarin, although my Mandarin at that time was sort of so-so. I, I improved a lot right now, but at that time it's sort of so-so. Um, but, but what I found is um, people appreciate um, me speaking to them in their local language and they become more expressive as to what they want to talk about. So I guess the point is um, sometimes something really, really small. Uh, sometimes there are things that can touch the people. Um, not, I mean, if you are too careful, right? Um, sometimes you need to be sensitive, but I think there are things that can touch people. There are things that will make people feel that you respect the culture, you respect the language. Um, I think that is something that um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an amazing experience for me when people try to um, open up and try to uh, appreciate the fact that I speak in the same language. So, so I guess um, the point I want to make is um, Southeast Asia is extremely complex, but I think we need to be strike the balance trying to by trying to understand them, but at the same time, not be so fearful about um, not uh, not 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 dealing with them at all, or trying to be so careful that um, misses the human touch that I think we need uh, for every single uh, culture. Yeah, incredibly important, incredibly important. And as I, and I think about you know the changing dynamics, which I, I mentioned in my opening statements about the considerations of age, and there will be certain leaders who have been led and trained and measured and managed. Uh, and assessed in certain ways. And uh, I won, I'm i really interested in the changing dynamics of leadership around the conversation of diversity and inclusion as well. Quarantine, really, really keen to hear your thoughts here and wondering what, you know, what rising executives should be doing to challenge their, um, their bosses when we're thinking about driving change in organisations around diversity and inclusion. Huh. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, uh... Before I get to that, I really want to uh, um, mention the fact that I, I love the way you put it, Glenda, when you say you've got to be humble about what you don't know. I just absolutely love it. I think that's the starting point. Know what you don't know, and then try to find out. So what rising executives can do, um, it's almost like what we what we must do, right? So um, um, I tend to go about it uh, with a variety of angles. So um, the, the person you're supposed to control the most, one would hope, is yourself. So I think the first thing that we have to do is lead by example. That's an obligation. Um, so we basically have to be what we say. So we have, as we believe and want to embody some change in diversity and inclusion, we have to be the person putting ourselves in the other people's shoes, exactly what we heard right now. You know, how do they think about me? What is the language? What is going to make them react? Um, what is going to be well interpreted? Am I doing well here? I think we have to be perhaps more self-conscious and acting on that uh, lead by example, really, really be the change and be very consistent in that. It's quite tiring sometimes, but you, you need to demonstrate consistency in embodying someone who is going to defy stereotypes and cliche. And basically you do that as long as you need until the environment gets used to it and that paves the way for, for others after you. So lead by example is the first one, um, definitely. Uh, and then some other things that we can do as rising executive uh, quite concretely is uh, some of the things that we do, for example, in LSA, we share our talents. So we spot talents in our team and we try to spot them in different um, uh, groups of, of age, of gender, of race, of ethnicity, if, if that's ever relevant for what we do, really. But we try to have it really diverse um, and we introduce each other's talents. So that we basically allow them to have their own network of allies and sponsors through us. So they come to someone who's sort of higher in terms of hierarchy, but they come with the uh, kind recommendation coming from, from each of us business heads. And then they meet and they grow and they can seek opportunities, uh, which I see as a duty. So you've got to uh, do the work to spot your talent, make sure that you make them visible, you create a network for them, you open some doors for them. And you make sure that 
the right people will have the right look at them. What I mean by that is in the talent I've spotted, and I know many colleagues have been there, very often some people, they have a lot of talents and because we see them daily, we see that talent, but maybe they have internalized some of the bias. Maybe some of them are too quiet or maybe some of them feel like they have to make excuse every time they speak. We now have some female colleagues who would, they're really, really laser sharp. They're really good. But every time they start a conversation, it's going to be all about, I might be wrong, but um, excuse me if I miss something, but unnecessary, really. So there's a duty there as well to help them be more visible, be more assertive, be recognized, uh, promote them. Um, so it's a duty. So lead by example, find the talent, promote them, uh, and shed a new light on them, and really nurture network and sponsors and allies. Uh, it's very important to have some people you can talk to in a safe way. And if someone calls you up, basically, because they need advice through that lens, take the call. Take the time and take the call. Definitely. And I love your point about, you know, you have to be quite relentless with it and consistent with it as well. But I can't help but think, you know, this is this is all great. You know, this is all wonderful. We've had a fantastic conversation, but there will still be some people in the organisation who are described to me as the sticky middle, uh, the permafrost layer of the organisation. And I and I kind of wonder whether there's something we can, what advice we can give to those who are just not quite getting the joke. Which is, and I wonder, Peter, from your perspective, I'm not suggesting for a second that you are one of these, by the way, not <laughs> two seconds. But, you know, what are the signals that, that indicate that reticent leaders are being left behind? <laughs> um, but thank you. First of all, I, I was just um, laughing because my first question would be, why are you a leader in the first place if you don't have the signals, if you don't know that the signals exist um, and you're being left behind? But I think there's three things I, I think about, and I think some of them has already been said. Um, the first one I think about is really accountability. Um, and when I think about the word accountability, I'm, I'm thinking about, um, I think, Corinne, you said, are you leading by example? Um, and when I say, are you leading by example, what I mean by that is, are you delegating this to a team and saying, right, well, this, this thing needs to be done by somebody else and just keep me updated every now and then? Or are you actually leading by example where you are keen, you're interested, and you take charge of that and to ensure that this can be done. You know, so that's the, that's the thing that I, I think about when I, I, I reflect on my own position and I reflect on some of the, the leaders I see who are actually driving this and the ones I see are being left behind. They are heavily invested. They see that it makes a big, big difference in the organization and they're leading by example. Um, the second thing I, I think about is transparency. Anything as a leader, we all know, if anything is important to you, measure up. And I think we talked about the fact that financial industry loves data. We love data. Mm -hmm. And so if it's important to you, you're measuring it, um, you engage in looking at, I'm not just measuring it, but thinking about the outcomes that it provides. You know, uh, uh, am I measuring so that I can see the representation that I need in the organization? Am I measuring so that I can see some of the exit interviews and I can understand some of the, the themes coming out so that I can put measures in place? So you have to don't just measure it, but you're thinking about the outcomes that's coming out of it and what you're going to use. So if you're not doing it as a leader, then I question what are you doing? Are you just watching the social media and the rest to get some signals? Um, and the last thing, which I think it becomes is I think is very important, is are you creating an environment where it's a trust a trust environment? And I think about two things in that space. The first one is if you're not hearing, if people are not discussing around you, the chances are there's something missing in the organization because this is something that is, is um, discussed all the time. But if it's not coming to you, then you as a leader, people are free to come to you to even discuss that. So are you creating an environment where people feel like they can have the conversations? And, and I think the thing that I have seen probably more so recently is the ability to create a safe space and listen to your people. And, and what I mean by listen, active listening and, and ensuring that you, you can absorb it and it can act on that. And I am seeing a lot more around that, but you should be prepared to be able to listen and adjust your views because some of the conversations are not easy to listen to, but it's important to do that. And I'm seeing that increasingly. So if you want to create a, a trusting environment, you have to create an environment where people feel like authentically they can bring their whole self. And the asset test is, are they saying that to you? Because they're not saying that to you, you're being left behind. Wonderful. Thank you very much. What I love about this conversation is we're not only talking about the highest level kind of concepts about diversity, inclusion, white matters, both from a leadership and also from a commercial point of view, but also really getting into some of the, the specific things that can be done. Now, I would like to go through this next section relatively quickly, if I may, because um, I, after that, I want to get into 
the dynamics that are at play right here, right now. But I do want to touch on some very specific areas. So we've talked, and it's all come out of the conversation, about networks, role models, sponsors, mentors, and uh, and also HR processes as well. So Peter, I'm going to stay with you actually. Just a really quick, uh, some quick thoughts, if you would, about networks are often described as having such a sort of positive impact as well. Um, but what advice would you give corporates when they think about their networks right now? Um. When, I, when we're talking about networks, I'm, I'm assuming we're talking about things like the, the employee networks within any um, organization of which I co-chair one of those and within um, Morgan Stanley itself. Um, look, I, the way um, I think about it is that these are uh, an essential and important part of any organization. Um, but you as a leader has to feel that um, from a strategic point of view. And I think, Iris, you talked about that, um, that you have to feel that the strategic intent is there and if the strategic intent is there to be able to get this done then you have to empower the networks to feel like this is part and parcel of the ability to achieve that and um, uh, certainly within morgan stanley um, every network conversation i have it actually aligns to um, the head of diversity and inclusion and as you can imagine recently we've announced that we're going to set up um, an institute of inclusion which is almost um um, staffed and manned by independent directors to help drive the agenda with the head of diversity and inclusion, including all the divisional heads around the strategy, what we're trying to achieve. So I think the strategic intent is important and where that is anchored is important as well. Um, mm -hmm. Making sure that the sponsorship is not just at any level, but is actually at the senior level. And, and for us, we're looking at the sponsorship to be at the operating committee um, level because the the connection and um, the discussions being having at the board level, it is important. Um, and I think that becomes important for the people who are part of that as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. As well. It comes, it comes straight from the top. Absolutely. And as well, being intentional about the people who you are selecting to be part of the steering committee of the network mm. um, is very important. Often, you know, people just put the, um, people in place and say, well, we think you should go and run a network. But I think it's important that we are, you are selecting people who actually represent um, the organization and then can drive the strategic agenda, but also um, in a position not just to say yes, 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 but also can mm -hmm. represent the teams and the groups on the ground and actually actively listening to them and representing them as well, because it's a two-way dynamics. And so it becomes yeah. an important part. And then I think the last part that I think about as well is the funding aspects. This is, if anything that's important, you have to ensure that you allow some sort of funding because what about programming that you're putting in place? Some of these things cost money as well. And I think I'm encouraged that even in the recent situations, most um, there's been renewed energy around diversity and inclusion, more so than actually um, cutting the funding. Because if you think about the whole pandemic situation, probably the first thing that would have gone is the whole networks, the whole diversity and inclusion. But actually there's been a renewed energy in that place. And so these things become quite important. Yeah. But my message is that it needs to be anchored towards the strategic intent of the organization. It cannot be something that's feel like is on the wayside is just for the people. And I think that's really important because certainly right now, we're going to come on to a second about why diversity and inclusion matters right now. Before we do that, I'm keen to hear from, from Glenda. I mean, you're all amazing role models in your own right. And we talked about the power of role models, and the importance of role models. Glenda, really keen to hear from you. You know, you're, you're as a role model yourself um, and also as you're encouraging other rising talent to step up and consider themselves as role models. What, what advice would you give? Yeah, I think, um, um, first of all, I agree a lot to what uh, Peter said uh, earlier, uh, creating that uh, trusted environment, I think it's, uh, it's extremely true. Um, so I actually think of uh, something, um, um, uh, I think of the word convictions, right? So I think just now we talk about you need to be accountable, you need to be a, like a role model. I mean, the first thing that um, for, for me is important is um, I think you need to be, you need to board in to the, uh, to the ideas. You need to board in to the ideas 100%. You need to be totally convicted to the ideas. I think once you're convicted um, to diversity, I think it becomes very natural. It becomes in your uh, DNA. So you can basically uh, practice it every day because um, 
you are you you bought into the ideas. So as a role model, I think number one, I think um, visibility is actually very important. Um, if you buy into that, you believe in it, but people don't know about it, I think it's um, it, you cannot influence people. So I think uh, visibility is uh, extremely important. You have to show people um, that you you really want to make a difference. As an example, when um, uh, I was invited to this uh, panel. I say yes straight away because I think this is important. Um, this is important to the uh, finance community. This is important for uh, for my people to uh, and my client, uh, the firm, to see that um, I, I I want to do that. Right. This is important to me. Um, the second thing is um, I need I think um, you need to think about other women. Right. We talk about creating this trusted environment. Um, when I'm asked to become like a mentor of somebody, some women, I'll say yes, right? Because I want to support them. I want to make sure that um, uh, they they have someone that they can look upon to become their role model and actually talk to them all the time. Um, and also in um, in uh, recruiting people, because we all have a tendency to hire people that look alike to us, whether it's men or women. Um, I want to make sure that I hire people or I actually interview people with, uh, with a wide range of uh, diverse experience. Uh, not only male, female, but I also look for people that have experience in uh, Europe. I look for people that have experience in the uh, US. I look for people that have uh, different backgrounds. Um, I want to see a wide range of candidates and I want to talk to a wide range of people. Um, I think that is uh, that is how um, I want to make sure we have diversity of opinion uh, within uh, my organization. Mm -hmm. And Corentine, then I, I would like to pick up the point that Glenda was just making there about um, mentoring. Mentors and sponsors has come up a few times in the discussion as well. And, and how do you encourage your peers, I mean, your peer group, to step up and become mentors and actually dedicate the time, the effort and the energy to it? Yeah, absolutely. Th thanks for the question, Julia. So um, sponsorship and mentoring are absolutely critical in individual careers, but also definitely organization evolution. So I would say, I would echo exactly what, what Peter has said initially. There is first sponsorship as in, it needs to be very clearly articulated within the firm that overcoming those barriers and making progress in this area is a collective goal and that people are expected to contribute to it. So there are many ways of making it clear in an organization. You can have some very official mentoring programs where you can include some diversity objectives within that. You can definitely have some funding for some networks. That's quite a clear message. You can have some measurement uh, for diversity in boards, in committees, in senior positions. It's also quite clear. You can also make it an objective for people, as in when it was appropriate in the industry. So there are many levers for a firm to explain that, yes, this is part of the journey, and yes, you're expected to contribute. So that's sort of the top-down sponsorship, right? Then for the rest, there's also how do we sponsor people and get sponsorship ourselves, as in the individual interconnection, mentor-mentee type of, of relationships. And there, it, it doesn't always have to be in an official program. It's probably better if there is one because then people who feel less comfortable uh, individually reaching out to someone more senior, they will have a little bit of a, a more of a formal space, let's put it this way, to, um, to get into a room and then meet people who have actually showed up to be a mentor and that might be easier for them. But apart from that, I think really um, no one should wait for those programs. You've got to reach out. I've had personally really amazing experience of uh, not only senior women, but a lot of senior women actually um, coming to me and offering me this uh, uh, mentorship role. And I was just about to ask them, so it was kind of cool that they, they came to me first, right? But um, the solidarity is really important. It doesn't mean you exclude those that are not like you. Absolutely not. But the solidarity can be important to create a safe space uh, and share the common experience that you, you have those people that are more senior than you, they will have had more of those. So you don't only learn from your own experience, you learn from them. And it works the other way around as well. Like people younger will come to you and ask to mentor them, as Glenda was mentioning, and you have a duty to say yes, and you have a duty to be available. And they don't have to be like you. They just need to have common sensitivity, and that can be coming from, from many angles. So I would say that. And then the hiring point is also really, really important. Um, hiring is obviously the first door. So we've got to make really, really clear that we um, don't have the wrong filter for what we're trying to achieve. 
And also always bear in mind that when we put, I, I like to have, maybe I, we never really do enough of that, but I like to have what I refer to as sort of troublemakers in each of the team I lead um, in, in a nice way. Like I like to put someone who has more of a quantitative background and maybe more business in a team that perhaps um, had been dealing more with uh, lobbying and regulation. And I've done that some years ago. And the just the, the fact that you would put those very different brains together they really, what flourished from it was, was amazingly innovative. Um, and same thing in my very quantitative uh, teams today, I like to include someone who has more of a macroeconomy background. We have like a Mauritian lady that just joined us and she has this uh, completely different geographic, academic background uh, within the team where she's working now. And I'm sure she's going to bring so much. So um, being very mindful of the fact that when you hire, what's missing in the team, right? Yeah. Which, which begs a really interesting question about, you know, because we're hearing how an appetite has changed, how, you know, leadership uh, is awakening to this, how, you know, many of the uh, galvanising factors and accelerating factors. But within organisational structures, and Iris, I want to come back to you just because it's, it's something you said earlier that's really stuck with me about, you know, HR functions and recruitment and, and many things have come out. You know, are they still fit for purpose? Well, I think we've come a long way. We've, we've made a ton of progress, in particular the big companies. I recently worked with a financial services company um, that uh, told me that they're using their data science team um, in HR now, and that's already a good sign for me. All right? That's the same kind of intentionality that Peter talked about, that we are looking at HR generally, not just diversity and inclusion, but generally with a business perspective. As in, we have KPIs um, to increase sa sales, we have KPIs to cut costs. Why don't we introduce KPIs for diversity as well? So that's the kind of intentionality that is required. Managers manage towards certain goals, particularly in the financial services industry. We're very used to that. So we just have to deploy the same kind of rigor that we deploy in other departments to our HR departments. And, and that is happening. It's particularly happening in the big firms. So I think that that is all great. I'm not saying, you know, we've solved it all. We're on a journey. We're trying to improve. We're learning. We're measuring, et cetera. But I wanted just to point out that there are smaller firms which might not have the big data science teams, might not have the professional HR department uh, that, that might not be able to do that. So recently I worked with financial, um, with venture capitalists, in fact. And I have to tell you, that's a very different world. They still told me, I look into your eyes and I feel it, right? And that we know that the looking into your eyes and feeling it, that's the home of bias. Um, so uh, we have to think harder about how to enable smaller companies kind of to benefit from some of these insights in HR rigor that now is driven by the bigger companies. And the good news again is that there's other small companies, tech startups, which provide the software for organizations to de-bias their hiring, their performance appraisals, their promotions, there's applied in the UK, by metrics in the US, there's many. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm focusing on the UK and the US just because I know these markets better than Asia or Africa. But yes, so, so I think that's, that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating, isn't it? Because there's the, obviously there's a role of technology. There are challengers coming through who are thinking very differently. And of course, you know, that, that there is a community that is all on a journey that we can learn from each other, but, but need not be the preserve of those with the biggest budgets, but certainly those with a common intention, which is, which is really fascinating. Thank you for all your thoughts around that. I think it's really important to think about very specific, precise areas uh, and, um, and to get into that. But I do just want to just dedicate the really this kind of the next sort of eight minutes of the, of the conversation, eight to 10 minutes, thinking about diversity inclusion right now. Now we have to, we cannot have a conversation about this without thinking about two very specific areas. One of them being COVID, and we're gonna to come to that in a second. But I would also, incredibly important is the conversation about race. It's a conversation that people don't like to have. Uh, I know that from having hosted many podcasts and many discussions about this, and particularly right now, there are some deep-seated concerns about um, institutional racism. Peter, I think my question is, you know, what's different to this time? This is not the first time we've been having a conversation about racism. What's what's changed? What's different? You are you're absolutely right. It's not the first time, and um, I I keep I keep um, getting asked the same question. Um, and I reflect actually back in um, back in the days of Amadou Diallo. I think that was 1999. Um, mm -hmm. um, the, the gentleman who was shot um, in Manhattan. Um, actually, when you look at his story, is um, and you look at his um, his background, is very very similar to to mine. And uh, someone who grew up close to to Ghana, um, actually lived in Asia, 
and then moved to the U.S. And I think within three years of moving to the U.S., he was shot. Um, if you think of my background, it's the same. I grew up in the U.K. I grew up in Ghana, grew up in um, uh, worked in Asia, and I've, I've only been here three years. I could have been him, right? So I kind of reflect on um, some of the nature around that. But then if you fast forward to the more recent cases, um, Ahmad Avery, that could be my, my three boys, who actually go for a run every day um, in the neighborhood. Um, no difference um, to that. And then Brianna Taylor, and then you've, you've seen George Floyd. And the, the point is, most of these, it's not going to finish. I think it's going to carry on. We're seeing that right now. The key is why, to your point, what is the difference? And I think that is, um, there's a subtle difference in what we're seeing right now and also a renewed energy and change. Um, one being the fact that the pandemic itself, um, coupled with probably some of the social um, challenges that we're seeing, like uh, unemployment, which is probably the biggest in the, um, in the, the biggest we've seen since the um, Great Depression um, as well, is predominantly affecting the, the black community. And, and when you couple that with the fact that everybody is sitting at home um, watching the media, the power of the iPhones and, and the fact that these days you can actually record something very quickly and project through the social media. And probably in the George Floyd incident, the fact that you can see somebody kneeling on someone's neck for over eight minutes and it's so pronounced. It doesn't matter wh who you are as a human being, you will react to that. And especially when it's coupled with people um, the, the COVID situation affecting a lot of the black community as well. People react to that. So I can see kind of a re renewed energy in the, in the reaction um, to that as well. And that renewed energy has not just been in the black community, but it's um, more universal and it's global, which is very important, right? Now, for, for the first time, my, my parent, my dad can call me from Ghana and tell me that actually this is what we need to do in Ghana to support you and everybody else. Then you know this is, this is real. So the question then becomes, what do we need to do? Because some of these are going to carry on. And only three weeks ago, I was taking my son to um, a soccer game somewhere in New Jersey. I got stopped by the police personally. And the allegation was that I was driving on a single lane and I was driving erratically. Um, and, and it was going to give me a warning. And, and I said, what warning for a single lane? How do you drive on a single lane um, when you're following three or four cars and you're driving erratically? The answer was, I, you touch the white line, you know. So these things happen. The question is that you must, we must focus. We must focus on the renewed energy around what we're trying to achieve. And I think in the organisations, what I've seen is that there's been a renewed energy to try and do things. And you've seen some of the things that um, organisations have been publicly uh, announcing, including Morgan Stanley, where we've gone out to support the community, um, support things like um, and, and NAACP. So these are key things that we have to do. But I bring it back to probably three things that I think is important. I think some of these things I mentioned, I mentioned, especially within the organization. Number one being that the renewed engine I've seen around the trust must continue. And I think the biggest thing I've seen is that now we're prepared to listen to our people and, and, and spend time listening to them. Whilst in the past, um, it is more around as I might view as a superficial conversation, but right now we're listening to our people. We're, we're taking that because until we can get a culture where people continue to bring yourself, the whole self to work, and you can get a culture where you can challenge things which are happening. Um, and you're in the meeting and somebody says something and somebody can say, you know what, that was not good. And you can address it on the spot. These things will take time. So we have to get into a trusting culture where everybody feels like they can bring themselves to work. I think Given the fact that we're talking about diversity, the power of allyship is important because if you're in a room and you're the only one saying it all the time, you become a broken record. And everyone goes, yeah, 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 let me ask Peter. Let me ask Peter. Um, but when you have the power of a, an, an active ally um, who are actually prepared to obviously lean a voice to the conversation, you see a very, very different dynamics as well. And what I've seen in our in the Black Employee Network, for example, which I'm, I'm leading, is that 50% of our membership is actually non-black as well, which I think is a very, very encouraging thing because we can then use that to, to actually support each other to be able to move the, the, the agenda forward. But ultimately, you have to come back and, and think about what you're trying to achieve because my view is that representation um, is important. Representation changes culture, right? And one of the analogies I always use, um, I always ask the question, 30 years ago, if you asked in the United Kingdom, where I'm named top two favorite dishes, nobody would probably say, um, Indian curry will ever come in, right? But today, probably when you name top two 
um, dishes in the United Kingdom, probably in the Indian curry will come in. Now, it, it's not by chance. It's because representation and things take time. But once you get there, you can see that it starts changing culture um, a little bit in the dynamics, right? And so I think part of that is we have to continue the agenda and, and, and move that forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank, thank you so much for your thoughts on that. Really, really practical. And, and the... Um... Uh, I suppose my next question there from then comes into there are still inherent biases that exist, you know, that underline sort of the question of racism that exists in organisations. And I think this is one of the big comments that's coming out at the moment, which is, you know, kind of organisations need to recognise where some of these biases ultimately lie. And, and the recommendations you've given are very clear around um, trust and uh, allyship and then also focus on what you're achieving. Iris, could I bring you in here? Because I mean, obviously deep de-biasing is, is one of your key areas. Just I want to just very quickly, any, any thoughts about, you know, what you're concerned about, particularly what we should pay, pay attention to? Mm. So, you know, what gives me hope is this focus on systemic racism. So we're moving beyond kind of the individual, but we are actually focused on the system. And I do think that's different. That is different from before. And so just to give you two concrete examples, one um, from academia. So this is the first year that at the Kennedy School, we have a required course on race and racism for all of our entering students. We haven't had this before. So why now? Um, because many of us, I think, had a bit of a wake up call of how little we, in fact, understood um, racism and particularly the history of race and racism in the United States in particular. But of course, that then motivated our students from India and saying, we also need a course on casteism. Um, so we can't have a course on every ism. But this go just goes to show that there's something happening. There's more of a movement and it's not just a moment. You know, from, um, again, from a financial services company, many of your organizations, I'm sure, also do these calibration meetings um, after performance appraisals where we kind of try to see how do men and women do, et cetera. So this firm I worked with, they did that for gender, but not for race. And they didn't do it for race because they said the sample size is too small for race. We might have one African-American woman in my team of 20. So how can I calibrate? Now, that's a fixable problem. Um, I, first, it shines the light on intersectionality, something we haven't mentioned yet, but really important that, you know, gender, race, sexual orientation, um, culture, of course, we're not just one identity, we're lots of identities, so we have to unpack that. So that's very important. But also for this organization, they now just cast the net more widely and do their calibration meetings across many departments so that they, in fact, do have a big enough sample size to also calibrate um, uh, based on other demographic characteristics. So I think that's, that's the way to go. So, so shining mm -hmm. the light on an issue and then moving to systemic change. Wonderful. Thank you very much for that. Now, I do also want to think about COVID and what COVID, is, what impact that has had on diversity inclusion uh, right now. Um, Quarantine, again, if I could ask you to be quite brief with your comments, I'm just really interested on, it's a big question, <laughs> granted, what impact um, COVID-19 has had on diversity inclusion in, in your point of view. Yeah, of course. Uh, thanks, Julia. So I'll, I'll keep it very brief. So COVID, despite the fact that it is the disaster that it is, let's try to have a slightly more positive look at it because it, it has had weirdly some positive effects as well, I believe. So one interesting feature of COVID is that by sending everybody home overnight working in front of a screen from their kitchen table or wherever it is in their home, um, in a way, to some extent, to some extent, it's, it's leveled the playing field because what it has done effectively, it has removed a good share of the informal setting and informal communication that normally happen around our, our type of jobs. What I mean by that is, you know, do you go to the, to the gym at lunchtime with your colleagues? Do you go to have a beer after work and so on? And we know for a fact that these informal settings are less accessible to certain communities that work in the office with us uh, because they're not used to it or they don't feel comfortable or they're just less accepted there. It, it can, there can be a variety of situations. And of course, as we had to reorganize ourselves more in bilateral, um, or in, um, you, you've got to see some very, very tangible res results because basically all the informal is kind of out of the picture. Maybe I think at least I've seen a few of them. Some people got uh, a bigger voice and have become a little bit more visible uh, because they deliver perhaps in a slightly shy and discreet way in traditional setting. But in a non-traditional COVID type of setting, we saw them more, we had them more. So I think there is, there is a, a positive element to all of this. Um, even if altogether it's been primarily destabilizing for most people. But what it teaches it, us is, you know, you've got to rethink the informal. Yeah, and it's, and it's a big topic that could be a debate in and of itself, actually. Uh, but I would, I would like to, as we just go literally into the last minute of the conversation, 
But I would actually like to turn to Glenda here, really, for, for your thoughts about as people are returning to work in different ways, shapes and forms, is what should we be thinking about? Just literally about the last 30 seconds. Yeah, sure. I think it's the balance between um, the business needs versus um, a people. Um, I think the organization should consider business needs, right? Like uh, HKEX as a market infrastructure, we're thinking about um, maybe we should still have split team arrangement because we need to make sure that um, the market is operating every day. We have to make sure things get done. Um, so we worry about like too many people coming back at the same time. But at the same time, I think when we think about uh, returning to work, we have to balance out the people needs. Um, I think it's all about uh, providing the transparency, providing um, information flow, and actually um, maybe possibly give people some flexibility. Um, so I think that those will um, those will be will, will be extremely helpful. And then last but not least is um, since people have been working from home for like such a long time, I mean honestly working from home could become the new norms um, in the uh, next generation, right? So I think we need to. Um, so now we are also thinking about some guidelines or maybe some possibility of people uh, working from home periodically as well. So I think we just need to welcome that, uh, this new norms. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for all, all your thoughts. It's incredibly important that diversity and inclusion stays high on the agenda right now for so many reasons that have come out in this incredibly rigorous conversation that we've literally gone from the highest dynamics into some very practical considerations. And also thought about, you know, during this current time of change, and focus on racial concerns is actually that gives us an enormous opportunity to really focus on the contribution that diversity and inclusion can make for our organisations, both locally, internationally and also regionally as well. It's been such a joy. Thank you so much to all our panellists today. I've been Julia Streets. Thank you for watching the Cybos Big Issue Debate.